Well, hey, everybody, this is Ross, and uh, welcome back to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night, 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk a lot about fruits, a lot about vegetables, how to use some of that stuff in the kitchen, and also really how to grow it. And some of the more weird and interesting fruits and vegetables that you guys have never heard of. So in this episode of Fruit Talk, we actually are going to mention some vegetables, some annual crops that you guys have probably never heard of. We're going to describe them in um, in as much detail as I can. But we're really going to be talking about our fall garden because we're preparing for that. In last week's episode of Fruit Talk, we did actually mention that we are preparing for it. We didn't really give too many specifics uh, of the plan itself. But uh, as of yesterday evening, today is the um, today's July 2nd. As of the 1st of July, I went outside and planted a number of seeds um, for my fall garden. So you may think, well, um, you know, if it's a fall garden, Ross, why are you not planting in the fall, right? Or if it's a winter garden, why are you not planting in the fall or the winter, right? Well, this is the time. It really took me a while to really wrap my head around this. For years, I didn't understand this. That in order, I mean, it depends on your climate, right? Some of you guys may have different timings than others, but to get a fall crop here or to have a winter garden here in the Philadelphia area, you have to plant in the summer. And that's really for most of us in the country is that if we are going to try to get something going in the fall or the winter time, um, the majority of us have to plant our annual vegetables in the summer. So if you were one of those people who thought, oh, well, I must have missed the window to grow food this year. I just can't do it. Well, here's a whole nother timing window here. We have basically a month and a half uh, or more to be planting vegetables um, to then be able to harvest those in the fall and in the wintertime. So... Uh, I know a lot of people out there who are very interested in gardening at first, especially this year in 2020 because of the because of quarantine, because of the virus and food security and how everybody wanted to kind of do different hobbies. I know a lot of people took up baking as an example. People probably took uh, took up different interests during this time. People just had a lot more time to themselves. So a lot of you a lot of those people as an example probably missed the spring crop window because the spring crop window happened when quarantine began so sometime in march and february you really should have been preparing all of this stuff to then have a spring crop um so a lot of you guys who thought you know file under that category then of course, well, all right, well, I don't really know what a fall, what a spring garden is or how to really do that. All I know is that when it gets warm, I can have a garden, right? Well, that, well, unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case for the majority of the vegetables either, because only certain crops really grow well when it's warm outside. So, uh, the timing's everything with this, guys. That's the point I'm trying to make here. The timing is everything. However, it's not doesn't need to be perfect there's a lot of leeway in certain things obviously in certain vegetables there's more leeway than other vegetables but uh, for the most part if you guys missed a couple windows you missed a couple timings you've still been thinking about doing this you want to take this more seriously um, now is a really great time the beginning of july is a really really great time and it extends all the way into uh, sometime in august so as soon as we get past that summer solstice, a lot of people can start growing and thinking about growing a whole new set of crops. So I would say as a general rule of thumb, if you've been following along, by the way, with our videos or our podcast, I would say, because we talked a lot about our spring garden this year, I would say the majority of the things you can grow in the spring, you can also grow in the fall with obviously some exceptions and some things actually don't like the spring but like the fall some things like the fall but don't like the spring so but the majority of those things and those families of crops like brassicas is a great example what are what are brassicas things like cabbages and broccoli and brussels sprouts um 
you know, tat soy or bok choy, um, you name it. There's all kinds of them. I think even, um, I think even fennel might be in that family. Uh, don't quote me on that, but there's tons of these. Um, even arugula, I believe, is in the in the um, brassica family. Kohlrabi is another one that we're gonna grow this year. Um, yeah, there's just all kinds of these different things that you guys can grow in this particular family. But these particular families of crops that you may be familiar with, um, if you can grow them, most of them, you can grow them in the spring, you could probably grow them in the fall. That's the point I'm trying to make. And the reason for that is because these different families of vegetables are just more adapted to the temperatures and the sunlight at those different times of the year. They have been growing in those types of climates and locations and latitudes for a long enough period of time so that they kind of require those special um, timings. So if you're going to grow something like, uh, let's say, squash, and you're going to plant that, let's say, for a winter garden, you're just not really going to succeed because squash needs all that heat, right? It's basically a plant that was very well adapted to very high heat. Um, and obviously soil temperatures that are way warmer than what you would get, let's say in December. So although some of you guys out there, of course, may be able to harvest some squash in December, you might be like lucky enough to do that. But the majority of us here in the United States, um, you can't. So that's my point is that if you can think about all the different crops that you can grow, we're talking about things like chard and lettuces, kale, um, kale is another brassica, any of the brassicas, carrots, beets, turnips, um, radish, um, you name it, cauliflower. We can go all the way down here. Uh, cress, um, even some alliums are planted in the fall, although that's not technically, I would imagine, a fall for the fall garden. Those are really for the spring. Um, but these are all really the things, even mustard, things I don't normally plant all that much. You can even do some peas. You might be able to get away with some peas. Um, I may look into that. I may look into some peas for the fall. Um, even you can do potatoes according to this, which is just insane. I didn't even think that was possible. But uh, right now I'm looking at, and what you guys ought to look at, because this is so specific to your location, I would highly recommend that you guys do a little bit of a search and type in your state and then in Google, by the way, your state and then month by month planting guide. And you'll get a number of different planting guides and honestly, some of them are more legitimate than others. Some of them may not even have the fall planting dates on them. They may only have the spring dates. The almanac, the farmer's almanac, as an example, has the dates based off of your county. In fact, it'll, it'll be really specific to where you live. But I find that on the almanac, at least I couldn't find it, that it doesn't have the spring planting dates. So you got to kind of dig around for these dates to really know exactly when to plant these things because I can't give you the exact dates for everybody. However, you can find these dates out really easily. Additionally, you may find these dates um, pretty darn well on a market gardener's website. So for me, I like to use Charles Dowding. Um, Charles Dowding is probably my favorite of the market gardeners. And the market gardeners are basically farmers on a very small scale. And they really know how to grow vegetables because they have no other choice. If they don't know how to grow vegetables in a small area, it's not going to, it's not going to work. So they really got the timings and all this, all this stuff down, but you can go to Charles Dowding's website and see the sowing timeline for all the different vegetables that you can grow. And he has it listed out here for month to month, every month, what you can plant. Of course, this is exclusive to England where he's growing, but find yourself a market gardener that may have some free information. Um, maybe you could even call up a local farmer or ask a local farmer and see if they have a specific set of dates that they like to follow or maybe a resource that they like to follow. 
the point is, is that you can do this. You, you really should have no problem finding these dates. So for me, I found it through uh, Penn State. Originally, I found uh, some dates through Penn State, and they have a Philadelphia planting guide, which is not exactly the best, I find. It's not really the most accurate to where I exactly live. However, it is pretty good. Um, and it does list the number of the crops here. As you, you can see here, it's broken up. It's the cooler weather, the warmer weather, and then again, the cooler weather, depending on the time of the year. So it does a, it has a pretty good list. It has a pretty good dates here. It has the starting dates, the ending dates that you can plant most of these things. However, it's not exactly perfect for my particular location. So I did a little bit more digging around, not just Pennsylvania, not just Philadelphia, not just my county. I looked at other states. You could look, I'm sure, in Jersey. Um, I'm actually really close to Jersey. I'm close to Delaware. Um, I'm even reasonably close to Maryland. So if you wanted to find out the best information and you think it's probably the best one for your particular location that has the fall planting dates, don't just look at your state. Maybe you guys live somewhere that has a number of states in the area. Like me, I'm in the tri-state area. So um, there's a lot of states very close to me. Um, in fact, I'm really only about five miles from Jersey. So uh, maybe a little bit more than that. Maybe maybe eight or ten miles from Jersey. But um, point is, is that... Just because I have a Pennsylvania guide and I live in Pennsylvania doesn't mean it's going to be specific to people who live in Pennsylvania, to all people who live in Pennsylvania, right? Um, so you need to really find something specific. And this is what I have found here that I think is the best one, at least for my particular location. And it's in Maryland, which is quite surprising. But um, it's legit, it's probably as legit as they come. So um, we're going to bookmark this <laughs> and uh, we're going to use this in the future for different dates if we absolutely need to. Now, another thing about this, these particular guides here, before we get into the actual things I'm going to grow um, and the dates I'm going to plan all this stuff out at, um, I want to talk about this particular guide because the guides are a bit they're never going to be perfect. They're never going to have every little piece of information that you need for your particular yard to the T. All the, all the information is going to be, you could stretch the information any way you want. And it's a good guide. It's a decent guide. Like this particular guide here is giving you like legitimately like farming, farming um, spacings, um, you know, the amount of seeds of a hundred foot rows. How many of you guys listening right now even have a hundred foot row, row of, of, uh, of soil? I don't think, I don't think I even have a hundred feet of, uh, of gardening beds. I don't think I do. So, you know, then they're talking about the depth and the planting distances and the, the spacings and just the spacings between the rows. And it's just like, pretty much a, a bunch of nonsense unless you're doing this on a really big scale and I wouldn't necessarily uh, put too much uh, put too much stock in, in all this kind of stuff however it does it is really helpful for particular people at least getting started I wouldn't rely on this kind of stuff however I would um, use it as a, a loose guide as to what you should be doing some of it, unfortunately, is really hard and fast spacing. So um, not that you couldn't get away with a closer spacing, but you really should keep the spacing um, that they're suggesting. And they don't even have corn on here, which is really quite strange because I was about, oh, here we go. So yeah, they say here, sweet corn needs a 30 to 36 inch spacing. Um, and that's in between the rows now within the rows is a 10 to 12 inch spacing so the spacing of 30 to 36 inches is pretty much standard they've been testing this religiously this isn't something that you can you know think you're gonna invent the wheel on here or something or reinvent the wheel 
the 30 to 36 inches is pretty much standard and while you could space your rows closer i think it probably would be a bad idea however the spacing within the rows 10 to 12 inches is in all honesty varies depending on what it is that you're trying to accomplish how much uh, fertility is in your soil how much water is in your soil how much you're willing to water how much what your annual rainfall is etc cetera, etc cetera. i could space i could have within the rows of my sweet corn i could space them two to three to four inches if i really wanted to um, the only issue is i'm going to have a lot more competition for water and nutrients so if i don't give these plants the right nutrients and water they're not going to get to that right size to be able to actually put out a tassel um, to have the right size to have enough pollen to have the right size ears of corn to have the right leaves for the right amount of photosynthesis it just isn't going to work um, so certain things i would say are hard and fast others you can really vary on I wouldn't necessarily, as I said, use this word for word. Now, the other thing here with these planting dates is that you'll see that whatever is highlighted with an asterisk, whatever has an asterisk near it, um, was is the dates that they suggest from transplant. So that's also something to consider. Is your guide completely in the dates? Are they completely listed from seed or are they from transplant? usually they're from uh, from transplant so this one here does a nice job of accurately telling me the differences between what is from transplant what is from seed I definitely do appreciate that um, all right so now that we've got you guys have found your guide you know what you're gonna do in terms of when you're gonna plant this stuff and you formulate a plan we got to formulate a plan here guys you got to have a spreadsheet you got to have some sort of thing listing all this out knowing where all this is going to go um we can start our plants indoors or we can plant them direct seeded okay we also need to do maybe some bed prep and that's a whole other thing that needs to go into all this because if you don't have the right bed prep when you pull the crops out you don't have enough nutrition in there um maybe your soil is actually quite dry after the prior crop we need to start adjusting these things we need to be focusing in on the bed prep because if you don't have the right bed prep you're never going to have successful plants so maybe we need to add some micronutrients maybe we need to do whatever right maybe we need to add more compost so all this is kind of should be turning in your head here as we go through this but what i want to do here is talk about some of the things that i'm going to plant um, that might be interesting to you and that was sort of really the main message here in this particular episode of of fruit talk was to get you guys in this mindset of planting for a fall garden um, get you guys thinking about this stuff doing the right the right research um, you know all the stuff that newbies need to get through this but now we're going to move on to some of you guys out there who probably are not new to this and are interested in what it is that I decided to grow this year. So um, some of the things here on this list we're going to go through. And then I actually have some things I've, I have uh, selected here um, that I just ordered seed from Fedco uh, that's going to be coming here hopefully within the next 10 days so I can plant this stuff out in the garden. Uh, they didn't seem to have any sort of delay in their shipping i think that's because they're in washington um it says actually it says me so is that maine um i think that's maine or minnesota maybe whatever the point is is that <laughs> wait yeah all right well it's gonna take two weeks so estimated for two weeks which i can i can live with so um Anyway, so let's see. I also have some seed packets here, some things that I'm going to plant as well. And one of the things I've been talking about, I think, for a while is actually the the Kyoto Red Carrot. And for those of you guys that know anything about this carrot, uh, let me know what you know. But I know that it's uh, a fall carrot, 
it's not really meant to be planted in the spring. I have planted mochum in the spring. Mochum's so good. Um, I'm really loving the mochum carrots this year. They came up nicely. They're doing really well. I have a ton of them. Um, this Japanese red carrot, though, is very sweet. It's supposed to have a very good texture to it, and that's really what I'm concerned with, and that's really what I want to find out is what the texture is like because I think I've already eaten this carrot at a local market and never knew what the variety name was. But I had a particular carrot. It was actually at Reading Terminal Market in Philadelphia that I, I bought them from, and they were the best carrots I ever had, bar none. And it was because of the texture. The core within the carrot was just almost non-existent. It was really something incredible. These are, they say, even better when you harvest them in the spring of the following year. And they've gone through an entire winter. So uh, we're going to plant a lot of this. At least that's my plan. And we're going to see exactly what the deal is with those carrots. We've also got here some beets. And uh, I actually have some beets over here. I went through a number of different varieties to try to find which one I like. I planted the Solyndra beet in the spring. And the Solyndra beet has done pretty well. Um, they're not getting to the right size just yet. Um, our beets didn't really get off to the greatest start this year. However, they're coming along. And uh, we should get a decent harvest of beets this year. And I just planted uh, more seeds of the beets uh, yesterday, yesterday evening. We've also got here, uh, this is actually, we planted some soybeans, by the way, just a little bit more soybeans here and there. But, um, you know, that's not necessarily for the fall garden. That is just to get myself an extra harvest of edamame some point down the road. We've also got here, in addition to the beet, I really am a big fan of the, um, the French breakfast radish. And this guy, I have tons of seeds of. I think I like these more than I like the Hakurai turnip. Um, I was kind of debating whether or not which one I like more than the other. But I think I like the French breakfast radish more. They're really good, even eaten raw. I like to eat them in raw. I like to uh, pickle them. Uh, my grandmother loves them. i got to give her some. Um, I think it's just a wonderful crop very short quick uh, you can plant them pretty much all year additionally you can plant the beets almost all year and the carrots you can pretty much plant all year here um, they all withstand the heat pretty darn well and although now we're after the summer solstice you would argue this is a better time than it was maybe a month ago which it certainly was but i would argue that uh, you can plant them pretty much any time of the year it's just that you got to have the right germination and keep the soil a bit cooler, moist. Uh, maybe the soil needs to be a bit shaded. Um, in all honesty, the beets definitely struggle when it's a lot warmer outside. So getting the germination that you want is going to be a little bit difficult. However, uh, like I said, if you are going to direct seed them, um, just keep the soil a bit cooler. And if you have the right bed prep, going into the fall you're gonna have a better chance of succeeding with direct seeding a lot of these crops and you could start beet beets here in um, in cells you could start the radishes in cells uh, you could even do the carrots however I don't necessarily recommend it but carrots like most of these things uh, that I just mentioned you know they gotta stay moist so the carrot, as an example, the, the real trick there is to have the right soil. If you don't have the right soil, you need to get yourself a board. And you lie the board over top of the bed of carrots that you planted. And that keeps everything moist um, long enough for them to germinate. I have actually really, with the soil I've used, the Just Natural Soil Conditioner, I've never not had, I've never had issues, I should say, never had issues with germinating carrots. I've always had carrots and they're ridiculously easy, I find, to germinate. So I don't know what people struggle with. Uh, it must be the moisture. We have a lot of moisture here, but I'll tell you the soil composition is big for the carrots. 
Um, another thing we're going to plant, but this is not necessarily for the fall garden either. I just planted this t yesterday. This is tat soy. So this is basically bok choy. And the bok choy likes, believe it or not, warmer temperatures. However, it does go really well into the fall. If you plant your tat soy or bok choy too early, um, like in the spring, it actually can bolt, which is very strange. And you would think, oh, that's not going to happen. That can't happen. I've never seen anything bolt because of colder temperatures, but it does. So um, you can plant pretty much bok choy anytime after it gets a bit warmer around here sometime in May. Um, and you can have bok choy pretty much all year going into the fall. I had bok choy and think in December uh, last year underneath the cold frame. Uh, let's see what else we got here. We got some Swiss chard and I've got this particular variety of perpetual spinach. I know a lot of you guys, one of you have recommended this to me. We planted some, I think sometime in May or even in June and it's now being able to be harvested but I don't necessarily know if it was this particular variety of Swiss chard or if it was, uh, I think it was this particular variety or if it was a Verde de Taglio Swiss chard that I really like. The both of them, it seems like, assuming that this perpetual spinach, I've been eating this in the last couple weeks, is that uh, they're very much like spinach. And I have found the baby leaves of uh, the Verde de Taglio. That's a variety of Swiss chard I really, really recommend. It's really just, they're both really, really good. And I eat them raw. You don't need to cook chard. At least if you harvest them at a more tender state, um, I just chew on them. I go out there and I eat them like I'm a rabbit or something, okay? And they're good. They're sweet. Uh, one of the best leaves of lettuce that you can eat. And I'll tell you, they stand up to the heat all year. I have my Verde de Taglio plants uh, that I've had for years are finally going to seed now. And they're putting out so much seed that I will probably never run out of Swiss chard or have to plant Swiss chard ever again. Um, and then one of the last things here we planted yesterday is my broccoli. This is a variety called Solstice, and this is more of a fall broccoli. It's very quick and early. And I also have another variety of broccoli called the uh, Waltham. I think it's Waltham 29, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, that one is more of a, a spring broccoli. However, if you, I've read that if you let it go into the summer, it won't really head up uh, properly. So a uh, bit of an issue there because some of my broccoli is a bit later than I would have liked this year. But um, yeah, I think the solstice broccoli here will kick in at some point. Um, and this is obviously from seed. I didn't, I didn't transplant any of this stuff. I have, I, I won't be transplanting any of this stuff just because of the amount of work that is required and everything doesn't have to be perfect guys. Like I said, there's a lot of flexibility in all this, but it says here on the seed packet, 71 days for the solstice broccoli. If I go back to the broccoli here on the Maryland planting guide, uh, it says plant your broccoli from July 20th to August 20th, but that's from transplant. So me, I'm transplant. I'm not transplanting my broccoli, which if you were going to transplant your broccoli, you'd probably grow your broccoli out for three to five weeks indoors and then transplant it out. For me, I'm just going to direct seed it, and I therefore I'm using an earlier date, like July 1st. So, yeah, it's a bit more difficult. And things can get to the seedlings. Um, you may have some pest pressure. You may have some slugs. It may just be too warm potentially. But believe it or not, guys, if you can get them to direct seed in your garden without any issues, it's just as good as transplanting them, if not better. Um, and it should be less work. So for me, uh, this is the way I like to do it. Um, if I would take this more seriously and I wanted – some really serious um, guarantees that I'm going to get these crops, I probably would not start them from seed, right? If I was a farmer and I this I depended on this for a living, 
I wouldn't be direct seeding. I'd be transplanting, right? But it is what it is. This is something I can get away with in my little section of my garden and uh, with enough protection and water and different things. Um, the right bed prep, it's a piece of cake. So um, the same thing can be said, by the way, for the cabbage. Although the cabbage needs a little bit longer of a season than the broccoli does. Um, so this one's going to be a bit tricky. We'll have to find out. But this is the variety here of cabbage that I'm going to grow. It's called the uh, Melissa, and it's a Savoy cabbage. I've never grown a Savoy cabbage. These are really the um, the types of cabbages that um, like the cooler weather. Um, they're more of a storage cabbage, I believe. They're really good to eat. Um because certain cabbages don't store all that well. And maybe it's the opposite here. Okay. Maybe the Savoy cabbages are not really that great for storing. Um, let's look this up. Because I don't exactly know. Hmm. I think there's a big difference here. Why is the answer given to me from cooks and chefs and things like that? You know what I mean? All right, here's Bonnie plants. Let's see what they have to say. Oh, they don't. Oh, yeah. Okay, so there you go. The Savoy cabbage is not a storage cabbage. It's a cabbage that is specific to be uh, better quality for eating and be used within a quicker amount of time. So these other cabbages that you can grow, whether they're in the spring or the fall, which there are certain types that require a spring or do better in the fall. Um, those are mainly for storage, but if you do a Savoy cabbage, they're better eating quality and that's why I wanted to grow them. I can very easily get a cabbage from the store um, that stores pretty well, that probably doesn't have nearly as good flavor as a Savoy cabbage could potentially have. So that's why we're gonna try them this year for the first time. Now it is gonna get a little bit close with the date that I can plant those cabbages because my seed is not going to arrive until maybe July 15th. So if I have the seed by July 15th and I'm looking here at the, well, yeah, so I guess this one here says July 10th to August 20th. So I'm still not late because if, even if I get my, seed by July 15th, that means, let's say our seed's gonna take a bit to get going to get to that transplant size. Um, so we still have August 20th before we can really plant our cabbage. So we still got plenty of time. It's not gonna be the earliest cabbage in the world, but we don't wanna plant some of these things a little bit too soon either, because if you think about Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cabbage, if they get hit with a little bit of frost, they actually become a lot sweeter and a lot more tastier. So um, I'm thinking with the Savoy cabbage, it's going to actually be a very good timing here. And I'm going to enjoy it. Another thing I really enjoy is fennel. And our fennel, we have some fennel that's going to be harvested. Uh, actually, I'm not going to harvest it. I'm probably going to let it go to seed. Um, if it does go to seed, I'll be happy because I have some bronze fennel that's went to seed. And that's all over the yard in a more ornamental setting. And those really attract some very good parasitic wasps that I find that are insanely beneficial for the bug ecology in your yard. Um, so fennel's a inval it's just a super valuable plant. Um, but it's really good to eat too. And I'll tell you, the, uh, the bulbing fennel here, the Florence type fennels that you can get um, are, are insane. They're very good. Uh, they're a lot like onions, but with a little bit of licorice flavor to them. 
and you can use them um, they grow all year by the way if you just cut back your fennel um, they'll just keep sending up new bulbs and you can get many bulbs worth of harvests from one particular plant um, it's really cool now if you were to let's say um, use them in the kitchen they really go well in something like a jambalaya um, I like to personally use either shrimp or hot sausage and then I uh, put in some maybe some peppers some onions some fennel we get a little bit of mushrooms in there maybe we add a little bit of penne maybe we can add um, you know you name it some red pepper you can get in there some some garlic um, it, it really comes out to be in a wonderful wonderful uh, meal every single time so for me the fennel is not just uh, super valuable for the, the bees and the pollinators and the parasitic wasp but it's just too good so we're gonna have ourselves a fall crop of fennel and we planted we're gonna plant this guy out again sometime around mid-july when I receive some seed but my other fennel plants we're gonna let those go to seed that I have currently um, so that I can of course collect more seed and not have to uh, continually buy seed every year um, yeah all right so we also have broccoli rob and I've grown different types of broccoli rob guys I've grown a uh, happy rich quite impressed with happy rich that's more of an asparagus broccoli type it's not necessarily broccoli rob per se there's similar there's also different types of Chinese broccoli it's called Kailan uh, there's all different types of that and I'll tell you that uh, I really like broccoli rob and, and this is the more bitter broccoli rob which I totally forgot the broccoli rob goes so well in that dish with the fennel you get if you can get this combination together you get uh, fennel bulbing fennel broccoli rob and hot Italian sausage you've got yourself an incredible combination of ingredients that right there in itself is enough and you can add anything else you want to that um, so for me we're gonna grow this as well as a fall crop for that particular dish um, and I'll tell you I've never successfully grown broccoli rob and I've grown as I said the other types the Chinese broccoli the happy rich um, but those are not bitter as the broccoli rob is and apparently according to this broccoli rob does much better as a fall crop so it should be quite more interesting to be able to grow broccoli rob um, as a fall crop and see how it does I'm really quite interested to uh, to find this out because I've never successfully grown it and I think that's also because I've never grown it in the fall I've grown rapini I've grown broccoli Rob in the spring uh, never with any good success so very interested to see how this one works out and this is a type of broccoli that again you eat the whole thing you eat the whole stem it's like a spear of asparagus that comes up it doesn't form a big plant or a big head of broccoli like broccoli does this is one single shoot and at the top of the shoot is the flowers of a small head of broccoli and the leaves are good very edible the stem is very good and again it has some nice bitterness to it um, that's quite good for you we're also gonna try for the first time this year some kohlrabi and I'll tell you uh, I've always been debating whether or not I should grow kohlrabi um, it's one of those things where I was like, should I do this? Do I really need it? Is it really even good? Should I try it before I grow it? Um, and I always settled on that. I settled on, I should probably try this particular thing before I grow it. But I never did. I don't know why. I think I can even get some right now at my local Asian market. But I never, I never ventured to even try it. So we're going to grow it. It seems very easy to grow, just like the other brassicas. Um, I'm interested to see how it works out in the kitchen, what it really tastes like. I'm sure it's going to be a lot like uh, the stem of a broccoli plant, as an example. 
Um, because I've eaten some broccoli stems before. They're quite good. Um, you know, maybe a bit more tender than that. Not so tough or woody. And it says here that if you let them go too long, they can become woody. But, uh, you know, I don't think that's necessarily going to be an issue with me. Um, and I'm sure maybe it does depend on the, uh, on the variety. But, yeah, I'm, I'm interested here to see how this, this works out. It says here the white Vienna kohlrabi is the variety here that I'm going to grab. It's an early dwarf heirloom variety with short tops, medium stems. The bulbs have crisp, white, tender flesh with a pungent taste. So the taste, I don't know what they're going to taste like. Um, I imagine something like broccoli. <laughs> but, um, yeah, they have a crisp, white, tender flesh. So that's kind of the difference here is that uh, you're not going to necessarily have so much of a problem eating the stem of broccoli. If anyone's ever eaten broccoli stems and you... you you peel off the skin, get off the woody parts, and you're left with that internal tender core, and you cook that up. Um, I imagine it's going to be very similar to that. All right. So I think we mentioned the uh, cylindra beet here that we're going to grow. Um, I've been roasting them, and if you really roast them in the oven for a long time, a lot of that beet flavor that people may not like kind of goes away. I was particularly going to um, grow beets actually for the juice, for pickling them, um, different health reasons. I thought it'd be interesting to see uh, what the deal is with the beets. Um, but of course you can saute them, you can roast them and still get that beet flavor that you're looking for, uh, for anyone that's interested. And there's also white beets or yellow beets, I should say. The yellow golden beets, um, you know, those, uh, I've actually tried the one from Row 7 Seeds. Uh, I forget the name of that there. Um, the, the Flame Badger Beet, I think it's called, or the Badger Flame Beet. And that one's pretty good. It tastes a lot like a carrot to me. We ate it fresh, and it was actually really good. Um, so I would even experiment if you're interested in beets, you really like beets, is try different colors of beets. Try the, the golden beets. Try the, the standard um, dark red beets. Now, we're going to grow two crops here also that are completely new to me, and I wonder how they're going to work out. I do. Um, I also forgot to mention that we're going to plant arugula because this plant here kind of reminded me of arugula but in the sense that just that the leaf kind of looks similar but it also really looks more like uh, a dandelion so my grandfather he's quite Italian man and he eats sometimes some of the craziest stuff that we all just look at him you know like can't believe you eat that stuff you know um, I being more adventurous have tried most of it and like the majority of it um there's a big debate in my family as an example one of the things we like to eat him and i is anchovies um especially in like pizza or pasta or red with red sauce and uh other half of our family hates them can't stand them and uh, I think that's one of the more adventurous things, more out there things, at least. That's a, a decent example. Another example of what my grandfather likes is dandelions. And in the early spring, uh, he tells me to go out there and harvest dandelions for him. And I'm like, you know, Grandpa, you could just go out there and you find them everywhere, you know. Uh, he's like, "Where are the dandelions at?" I'm like, you just gotta look, you know. They're 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 everywhere. These things they're hard to get rid of dandelions, as some I'm sure most of you guys know. Um, but he eats them damn things, and I'll tell you, um, they're quite bitter. And if you don't really get them very very early in the year, they're not good anymore. So, for some of you guys out there who may have tried dandelions before, you gotta. You got to really, uh, I think, get them at the right time. 
if you didn't really necessarily like them. They're quite bitter, as I mentioned. A lot of people don't like bitter foods. I don't necessarily like bitter foods. I figure this particular plant, the Italico Rosso Chicory, um, might be quite similar. Uh, it says here, savory Italian chicory, often mistaken for red dandelion, um, nip off the deeply toothed red vein leaves for a delectable treat. Ideal for braising, good in spicy mes mescaline mixes. It imparts a mild dandelion flavor. Um, often moderately tangy in cool weather and can be somewhat bitter in the summer heat. So I imagine this one's kind of similar to some dandelions. I don't necessarily want to grow dandelions. I'm trying to get rid of them damn things. And they have a very short window of harvest. So let's say this chicory can be grown in the fall, um, planted now actually, and we can get some dandelion leaves that might be a nice little alternative to dandelions themselves. I may be more interested, more inclined to grow this kind of chicory than, than dandelions as an example. Um, we'll see. I'm not going to plant many of these things. Some of the stuff I'm trying for the first time, like the cabbage, uh, like the chicory. And then another one here is the endive. Um, and the endive is actually very similar to chicory. Um, and chicory or radicchio usually forms these hearts. They usually form these kind of like a, uh, a cabbage heart. Um, that's a bit different. It's a bit more bitter, um, more interesting. I'm sure it has a different texture, um, different plant altogether, very different in terms of how you grow them. Um, now, some of the chicories and, and um, radicchios don't end up forming hearts, which is exactly what we just looked at, which was the Italico Rosso chicory, is that this one's really just there for the leaves. It's not necessarily there for the heart. So some of them heart up and some of them don't. And you got to be really careful about which one you pick if you're going to be growing them for the hearts. And I, as I said, am not. Um, however, there is another type of, well, it's so, it's closely related, but I wonder really how close this thing is, you know, because it looks so different than the other types of chicory and the other types of um, of radicchio that I've seen. I mean, the radicchio hearts almost looks like a, a cabbage plant. It's so strange how different these these different plants are. It's so weird. Um, but the endive here is kind of like uh, frise. So that's what chefs use them uh, for. And that's, I guess, what they're also called here, it says known to chefs as frise. So I really enjoy types of mescaline mixes um, in my salads. Now, sometimes I, it's just a struggle to really get, um, you know, different things to really work out um, that would normally go in a mescaline mix type, type salad. Um, you know, as an example, let's see here, you got endive in this one here, you have arugula, um, radicchio lettuce, upland crest, crest. So, um, you know, there's a pretty big balance here, but what I really like is the texture of these different things. I really like the flavor and the texture of arugula. I like the endive. Um, I like this, uh, uh, man. No, it's not endive. What is the name of this? Um, darn it. This white thing here in the mescaline mix. I don't remember. But I'll tell you, if you can get these little things here that have a lot of texture to them, 
They may not be the tastiest things, but they have a lot of texture you can find in various salads. You can bring your salad to a whole nother level. So for me, I'm going to grow some endive, okay? Um, quite interested in this whole thing. Maybe that's what this is, is a... Mm, it might be a, bl a blanched endive that comes up from the roots in the spring. I'm not sure. I'm going to have to look into this what this particular white thing is here. I may have even grown them one time because I've actually planted this particular mesclun mix here. But anyway, the, the point is is that <laughs> we're getting sidetracked. It's that uh, the endive and um, arugula and different things to form a mesclun mix is a really nice way to eat salad. Um, so for me, we're going to obviously plant the arugula. It's irreplaceable. I really like, by the way, as well, the uh, mizuna. But that's more of a summer thing that I'm harvesting right now. Whereas the endive here, um, again, can be in the spring or in the fall. Um, actually, it says here that this particular endive is suitable for late spring and early summer. Interesting. Well, I think we're going to try it anyway. It says here, uh, or in the fall. Yeah. Best in cool weather. We'll see. We will see. But yeah, guys, those are some of the things here that we're growing this year for the fall. And, uh, yeah, I can't stress it enough that you guys should get yourself a plan, figure out what you're going to grow. The clock is ticking. We're running a little bit out of time, although, as I said, we do have some flexibility. Get yourselves going here. Figure out what you guys are going to grow for the fall. I found uh, a number of different interesting crops here that are going to be new to me that are really quite interesting. So just a little bit of a... You know, recap, we're going to grow things like beets and broccoli and Brussels sprouts, savoy cabbages. We'll have carrots. We're going to have some chard. We're going to have um, endive. Let's see. I may even try to find myself some kale. Uh, we're going to have kohlrabi. We're going to have um, some arugula. We're going to have... Potentially some peas. I should start thinking about these peas. If I can find some peas that you can plant um, actually in uh, in the fall. Because I know that my, uh, my sugar and variety seemingly so far doesn't do all that well in the fall. So who knows? Um, maybe I need to plant it at the right time in the right bed. We'll have to see about that. Let's see. We're also going to have radishes. We're going to have... Um, I guess you could say spinach in the form of some uh, Swiss chard, right? Um, and that is, oh, turnips as well. But that's mostly it here, guys. Um, quite an interesting little uh, video here, I think, for you guys. Different things that you guys can grow. You guys probably never heard of. Um, really well worth growing. I think a number of these things. I hadn't really put a lot of stock into some of this earlier. And I was pretty limited in what I could grow or thought I should grow in the fall. Also, the timing of all this was always off for me. We're taking it very seriously this year. And um, I'm already very proud of the summer garden. Not necessarily proud this year too much of the spring garden, but we're still making do with what we're getting. And I'm happy to be getting what we're getting. Um, but the fall garden, I think, will be a lot better off this year than our spring garden. And uh, we will see everybody soon. Thank you guys so much here for joining us for another episode of Fruit Talk. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, you want to support the podcast, please consider supporting us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Ross Ratty. Um, and also, guys, check out our blog, figboss.com, and check out our Facebook and Instagram pages and YouTube page if you guys are not watching us here on YouTube because as we are, now, as some of you guys probably know, we're not on YouTube, or we are on YouTube, but we're not um, exclusively on YouTube anymore. 
we're on uh, iTunes, Spotify, and all the big major uh, podcasting sites. So, yeah, again, thank you guys so much. We'll talk to everybody soon. Stay safe out there.